thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Jain Nagundran from Tevisol. Correct. And you guys are coming out with some pretty fantastic technology these days in regards to preserving uh, organs outside of the body for uh, a later down the date transplant. Not too far down the date, but a later down the date transplant. Um, can you kind of take us through your beginnings? We're going to start there because you guys have a real um, uh, Apple-esque kind of you know, a story right from here out of Alberta and, uh, and a little bit of Saskatchewan. Uh, can you kind of take us through that on where you guys started? Yeah, so I mean a little bit out of Manitoba actually. So, <laughs> so my, my, my colleague, Dr. Darren Freed, he's another cardiac surgeon, so we were both heart surgeons. And uh, we both have an interest specifically in transplantation. Uh, and that's where our training was specialized in in transplantation. He in the U- in the UK and me at, at Stanford University. And then we kind of combined forces when he moved to the University of Alberta to start a lab that actually explored keeping these organs alive outside of the body longer. And and where Darren started, and as as heart surgeons, we use the heart and lung bypass circuit on a daily basis. He actually started by buying some of these circuits on eBay, used parts basically, bringing them into his garage and, and you know, taking them down and reprogramming them to build them, basically all the way up to do what that organ needed, starting with the hearts. And then when he moved to Edmonton here with me, we started working on the lung project together and he built a device for the lungs. And that's quickly accelerated from his garage to our lab to hundreds of animal testing, to human organ testing, to now actually have done 12 successful human transplants. That's unbelievable. And I mean, when you say accelerated, it happened in a short time because you guys kind of started this back in 2015, correct? Correct. And and we're here now and you guys are at a stage where you've done a, a little bit on the human trials and now you're moving into other organs and starting to test that out, which is mind boggling fast, especially in this field of work when it comes to health and and medical advancement technology. So very, very cool. Super big congratulations to you guys. Um, What are, so again, what you're doing is you're sustaining uh, organs. Tell us a little bit about the applications that something like this can be brought into. Where are people going to benefit from this? So that's a great question because right now we have these small transplant wait lists all over North America and the world. And, and people are dying waiting for organs. But in reality, there are millions and millions of people dying from end-stage organ failure. Mm. So every minute in the U.S., there's four people who die from heart failure and lung failure. And so from that kind of statistics, there's a huge unmet need. And what our technology tries to do is help bridge that gap because right now, even though everyone knows there's not enough donors as is and there's a lot of awareness to increase the amount of donation, even of those few precious donors we have, we use a very small percentage of them for transplantation. In fact, over 75% of the donors we get offered, we discard their hearts and lungs. And so it's that tragedy that there are things within the donor at that time that make those organs look suboptimal that we think by bringing the organ outside of the body and putting it back into a more natural environment, not something that's going on with the donor that might be harmful, that we can actually liberate that organ and give it an opportunity to function in the way we think it could. And as we've accelerated into human trials, we've actually shown that. We took 12 sets of lungs that were gonna go in the garbage and we converted them all into usable lungs on the machine, and based on that data, went on to 12 successful lung transplants. And all, knock on wood, all 12 patients are alive over a year out now. That is fantastic. I know when we talked with, uh, we, we had some discussions with the Alberta Lung Association, and they talk about how delicate the time is between, say, an organ donor in a, in a vehicle accident, and uh, from getting the time from that accident happening or the passing of that victim to the transplant to a a door, an organ recipient, that window is very tiny and uh, degradation of, of the organ might happen in the process. Um, But then you and I had had a discussion off uh, camera earlier in regards to the pressure on a physician now to actually get that organ transplant done on such a time crunch and be effective. Can you talk a little bit about how this is going to change the practitioners of medicine and where this is going to open up doors for them as well? Yeah, that's uh, that's absolutely correct. To give you the insight into it is when that lung is procured, wherever it's procured, let's say 
the donor was in, in Winnipeg today, and we're here in Edmonton planning to do that transplant operation, it starts to slowly die from the minute it leaves that donor and it's placed in the ice cooler, the bucket of ice right now. Yeah. The, the fairly unsophisticated same bucket <laughs> of ice you would take to a barbecue, really. And, and it's slowly dying coming to my center. And we have about six hours by which time you start having some permanent damage to those lungs. Mm. And after about 10 hours, they're gone. And so because of that really delicate time balance, we're oftentimes, while my team is flying back, starting a very complex operation in my patient. And by the time the organs arrive, hopefully I've been able to take out the lungs in the patient that needs the transplant. Sometimes it's more complicated in there and the organs are waiting longer, slowly dying. Sometimes we open up the bucket, the ice cooler, and there's something wrong with that organ that we didn't even know about. And we're stuck because we're, we're going to sew them in no matter what because we have no choice at this point. Right. So there's so many risks associated with the unknowns, which is part of the reason why we turn down so many organs. But when we take time out of the equation, when the organ can safely be saved for at least a day or so, and also have ongoing evaluation at normal body temperature of what that organ is doing, then not only can we do it, it during daylight hours, which is important to me as a surgeon <laughs> trying to get some more sleep, yeah. but, but also it actually shows that outcomes are better when you can do it during daylight hours. And on top of that, it takes away that stress of trying to deal with the delicate operation and worrying about the organ consequence at the same time. So, mm -hmm. so all of those factors can be mitigated to lead to actually better outcomes. So not only could we potentially use more of those organs, but we could actually have a better outcome with those organs by improving the quality of the transplantation process yeah. itself. You just get that time to do the assessment to make sure it's done right. D time to do the assessment, uh, time to place it most appropriately. Mm. You know, maybe sometimes we might have the, the best recipient for that organ might be in Saskatchewan, but we might be stuck trying to get that person here on time because they needed to start the donor operation at a certain time. And for all of these reasons, we could be limited. Gotcha. In fact, this weekend I did two uh, double lung transplants and there's potentially a third one, but based on timing, we couldn't accept all three because two of the donors were happening in two different cities at the same time. Right. And because there's other teams involved, liver teams, kidney teams, that it's too much for one team to request a big change sometimes. And in this case, we simply couldn't use those organs based on time. Right. Speaking of time, let's talk about some of the things that you guys have been recognized for. You guys have gotten a lot of attention because of this development, uh, more so in the south right now from NASA. Can you talk a little bit about what happened down there and, and what that means for you guys? Yeah, it's a very exciting, almost a surreal situation <laughs> where we were asked to apply to the NASA iTech program, which is a program which you could consider it kind of as a spin-in program where NASA kind of puts out a feeler to see what startup companies in the technology space are doing things that are independent companies, but yet may have an application with NASA. Mm -hmm. And so there's hundreds of applications, and we were chosen as one of 10 companies, two from Canada, actually, to, to present at the forum in February. And, and we were very fortunate to actually win the competition. Gotcha. And, uh, and that's been a, a real big boost to our company because it validates that the type of technology we're developing doesn't just have an application in the space of transplantation as we see it at this moment, but there are other applications. For example, with NASA, they have a, a moon to Mars mission where they hope to take someone from the moon to Mars, and, and they look at ways of trying to keep astronauts from aging, from experiencing over use of during long periods of time in space, and so they want to study hibernation, which is not mm. anything that I ever really <laughs> considered. But now you could potentially look at some of those things on an individual organ before you actually try it on an astronaut right. um, by trying to test some of the techniques they may consider that. Not only that, their astronauts are exposed to very high doses of radiation. There's opportunities to study that both out in space and mm. potentially even back here by mimicking those situations specific to certain organs in an isolated way. So so there, there, those are some of the applications that NASA's interested in. I did speak 
before that we, you know, started with hearts, we moved to lungs, we also do livers and kidneys, and most recently, we've also started to perfuse limbs, like, like arms. And, and the purpose for that is there's a over a million patients, uh, not patients, people around North America with traumatic amputation. And there's a very low rate of successful limb a- transplantation at this time, mm-hmm. in part because that organ is very sensitive to being in a cold environment and and then the subsequent transplant. So we have a potential to poten- to help patients who have had these traumatic you know, amputations, which does actually include other jurisdictions in, in the United States as well, including, you know, potential, de- potentially the Department of Defense. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, we, you have amputees, war amputees all the time. Uh, we've got people sweeping mines all the time. And if they run into an incident, there's an opportunity here to at least bring some normalcy back to their life from what they've lost. This is unbelievable. Like, I mean, when we talk about future of health, we're talking future of health when you start bringing NASA in and looking at some of the those long-term futures that could, this could be applied to. Super awesome. How about some of the people that have helped you out? How have you kind of gotten to this point here? Uh, like, who are some of the people that have backed you and, and, and made it happen, especially right here in Alberta? Yeah, we've been very fortunate. So, you know, we started at the University of Alberta. Tivasol started there. And we've had very supportive faculty uh, in the Faculty of Medicine, in the Department of Surgery. We've then um, had, you know, a lot of opportunity through Tech Edmonton, who's helped us as we started off as a, as a spin-off company. Um, we've had support here through uh, the Health City Initiative as well. And so that type of publicity has led to some notoriety that leads to foreign interest in our yeah. company. And in fact, there's significant interest uh, outside of Alberta itself in what we're doing, mm-hmm. which hopefully can bring potential investment back into the province. Because right now we have eight full-time employees and when we plan to expand that to double that number over the next year as we start manufacturing devices for international testing. Right on. So what are some of the things that you need now to get you to the next step? What's the next page in your book for the for the advancement and, and the more uh, application of Tivasol? Yeah, so the very next step with the clinical advancement and bringing these devices into the market so that patients can actually benefit from having more transplants with these donors that aren't being used is to do what's called a pivotal trial in the United States. And that's mm-hmm. something that the FDA requires for entry into the U.S. market. In Canada, because we're listed as a class two medical device, we're able to enter that market more easily. So we actually will be operational in the fall here in Canada. Awesome. And so that is a big step. The other steps toward the future of Tivasol include the collaborations that come with what other scientists are doing. So for example, you've probably heard of people trying to 3D print an organ or maybe take an organ from uh, from another animal and decellularize it, take the cells away and recellularize it, put in human cells. And all of those things are potentially possible, but at the end of the day, they're going to need to be tested on a stable platform to show that that organ is going to be functional prior to a surgeon transplanting it into somebody. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, we build a platform and the world builds the ideas around it by which it could be potentially used. Immediate use, of course, is increasing the number of transplants that could be done today, but we see a much bigger utility for this type of technology. This is wicked. Thank you so much for coming in and sharing all this with us. We're going to be sure to push this because this is some really cool stuff that the general public and and many more people need to know about because it is going to be, again, it's a future of health initiative. It's uh, it's going to change. It is changing lives already. Obviously, we've seen that. And uh, it really looks like it's uh, the vision can be endless uh, on on where it could take us or the new doors that it can open uh, for us in the future. So thank you again so much for coming on and sharing this with us. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. The last thing I would mention is yeah. I'd like to thank the University Hospital Foundation as well. Absolutely. They've been super, super supportive from the get-go. Great to hear. Great All to right, hear. All right. Thank you, Bryce. Super. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Ooh, that's cold.